Hello, everybody. Hoping uh, you've had a good day and wherever you are in New Zealand, you're not too cold. Uh, for those of you that are joining our sessions or session for the first time, uh, this is um, a monthly webinar that we use a variety of uh, speakers and information re relating to caring for people with dementia. So today it's my privilege uh, to invite two ladies to talk to us about music therapy, something um, that's very specialized and something that the evidence says has enormous beneficial effects for people. So today I'd like to welcome Jenny Gordon and Arcadia Montera, and they're going to give a, a, web, a fabulous uh, session, I'm sure. If you have questions, please put them in the chat. And at the end of the session, I'll ask these questions to the ladies. Ladies, would you like to uh, start? Excellent. Well, um, thank you so much, everyone. We really appreciate you being here today. Um, we are going to be touching base on music as an evidence-based therapeutic recreation intervention. And a little bit about who I am, who you're going to be talking to you, who is going to be talking to you today. Um, I'll pass it now on to Jenny. Ko Herald Toku Toku Waka Ngati Pakeha Aho, Ko Henry Rawa, Ko Marianne Williams Oku Tupuna, Ko Hikurangi Te Maunga, Ko Uawa Te Awa, Ko Jenny Gordon Taku Ingoa. So um, thank you for sharing this with us. Yes, thank you so much. I am. Um, a registered diversion and recreational therapist. Uh, Jenny is a registered music therapist. And I am currently the president for the DT Society and the National DT for Somerset. And Jenny over here, she has her own um, company, which is Music for Wellbeing. And we would like to share this live with you. And we would like to ask you, if you can please just write in the chat, what do you see on the screen? Just type it on the chat, whatever it is it that you see on the screen, whatever it is it that you might be reading in there. And I want you, we want you to keep that in mind for when we finish the session. Okay, so just gonna give you a few more seconds and then we're gonna move into the next slide. Okay, shall we move it now, Jenny? Awesome, let's go. Uh, we would like to start with, um, the United Nations and the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And we would like to highlight Article 24 and Article 27 because sometimes we forget that access to leisure, access to doing the things that we love doing, it's actually a human right. But at the same time, we as humans, we have the right to participate in cultural life, in the community and to enjoy arts in this case, music today. Um, a lot of us are fully aware that when we are working with people living with dementia or Alzheimer's or any type of dementia, we might have a strong focus on making sure that they get a good meal, that um, they have good personal care, that there is good medication, and obviously good healthcare has proven that people are living longer. However, we know even ourselves that that is not enough. That to keep my soul going, I need to have something that gives meaning to my life. Something that is also meaningful for me. Something that I can relate to. Something where I say I have this sense of belonging, um, a purpose. Because there is no point of living with dementia and possibly having 90 years, being 90, if there's nothing else that actually fulfills my soul the following day when I wake up. So we would like to number one, clarify that diversion 
is not therapeutic recreation, no recreational therapy. A diversion is something like, might be an action that attracts your attention away from something. And if we use a quick example, playing music on the radio might be a good diversion strategy, but it might be considered a quick fix. What is diversion and recreational therapy? And this is where music actually plays such an important role for us. So we focus on organizing, designing, coordinating, implementing, and evaluating person-centered recreational programs. We focus on giving the person the choice to actually have access to meaningful activities, or we design programs that are specific for that person to enhance the quality of life. For example, music, and we're gonna be talking more about that. Therefore, the focus is on the ongoing support and development of health domains, spiritual domain, cultural domain, physical domain, cognitive domain. Recreation is a great way of service provision. We know that anything is possible. However, it's on what kind of evidence-based intervention we're using to get a good outcome. Um, probably you are aware of this, but if you are not, in ancient Greek, philosophers actually taught that music could serve as a therapeutic purpose. And it is quite interesting that um, we are just making a huge emphasis on this mm -hmm. in, recent, in recent years. Oliver Sacks? Yes, Oliver Sacks famously said that while somebody might remember the lyrics, somebody with dementia might remember the lyrics to a song, they might not remember what they had for breakfast. Um, and so he, he was basically saying that music provides opportunities for people to um, reconnect and temporarily perhaps restore themselves back to themselves. So the part of the brain that keeps going and recognizing music and is activated by music um, long after other forms of cognition have had ceased um, is, is uh, very interesting. So music can be used right to the end. So we would like now to share with you this video, which you might have seen, you might have not, but it's just to show that one of the most used evidence-based therapeutic recreations are music interventions, such as music therapy.
<risa> Hay que coger la punta, ¿verdad? <risa> Eso es más piedra, ¿no? Son 50. Padre mía. Jenny, music therapy. Um, well, trying to sum it up is quite difficult, but um, music therapy uses music to achieve non-musical goals. So encompassing all the domains and um, across the lifespan. Um, there is an inherent um, relationship between the client and the therapist and the music. And where those three things interlock um, is where the music therapy can happen. Um, and it, it is a strongly related to the relationship there, therein. So when you were looking at that video, uh, the person that you saw is the Spanish prima ballerina Marta Cynthia Gonzalez. She died in 2019. Um, she was living in Valencia, Spain. I think it's one of the latest examples on how music, especially for people living with dementia, has this powerful effect. And what we're going to be talking a little bit more about it regarding the importance of music in our lives is that regardless of the stages of dementia, regardless of my cognitive abilities or my physical abilities, there is something that still connects with me through music. Jenny. Uh, yes, um, and there is something called amnesia, which um, is the, the absence of a musical ability, which can affect people either from birth or from um, a changes in their brain. But, but most people genuinely um, have a relationship with music. Um, so the tone deafness um, isn't a sign that they can't relate through music. So if you've got somebody that sing like they still um, have can have a relationship with music and um, it's it's inherent in most people's lives. So there's links to early communication, identity and culture self-esteem, et cetera. Um, and then it is the part of music that the, what the brain re responds to, uh, what we call the elements of music. So you can use these um, to interact with people. So different parts of the brain um, will be interacting with rhythm and different parts will be interacting with the, uh, the emotional evocation. So it depends on what is going on with the person's brain as to how you can most reach them. It might be through rhythm, it might be through melody, or it might be through tone. They, they like a particular instrument. So um, it, it pays to work out for each person which of these elements to concentrate on. Uh, that's going through very quickly on that slide. Yeah. yeah. So when we're going to the next one, and um, when we were initially talking about using music as an evidence-based therapeutic recreation intervention, um, in therapeutic recreation, positive emotions are essential. They are essential for um, opti optimal functioning. Um, therefore, there, there's an essential topic within the science of well-being, 
And when we talk about well-being, obviously it's individual and it is subjective to every single person. However, if we know what is it that makes this person move, um, we can actually have really good outcomes. And music has been proven, and there is enough research in these days and literature reviews that music is a fantastic intervention to use in therapeutic recreation, mm -hmm. or it can be in any supportive environment, or it can be out in the community to actually enhance the quality of your life. Um, this is um, a pilot program that was run recently in 2000, and, oh, I think it was 19, um, done by a colleague, Sherry Story. So I was actually there when she presented this You'd be able to find this um, pilot program study on the Selwyn um, Foundation website, and I've put the, the foundation link there. Um, they wanted to provide engagement in life through meaningful activity, um, and, and it, it's quite clear, the slides that she's I don't need to tell you because I'm sure you can look, look it up yourself, but she's put through um, the, the types of sessions that she ran, like she, she bookended the sessions with some kind of hello song and some kind of goodbye song um, that was negotiated with the people. She's got some lots of fabulous information about... Um, how people interacted after the session through the staff, from the, the staff um, giving some feedback. She's also talking about the MIDAS, Music and Dementia Ass um, Assessment Scale. Um, at the end of the presentation, there's also information on that if you wanted to conduct your own research. But it's recent and it's New Zealand and it was very positive. Um, and, and Sherry actually is one of the um, recognized people in this field for music therapy. So I suppose it's, it's to endorse that um, enjoyment and involvement and participation um, all come together, mm. which is also about social connections when we're talking about people living with dementia. And uh, there's also plenty of research that shows that people need to be connected um, because in that way they get that stimulation that they need to keep going. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about music in leisure. Music in leisure. This is my life, I think. So um, do I live a leisurely life? I think so. <laughs> um, so what could be optimum, I think, in caring for people with dementia would be singing groups, um, and music making with instruments um, and telling soundscapes if there's no language maybe they can use the instruments to demonstrate how they're feeling and have little conversations with other people in the group um, movement is as we saw with the lovely ballerina it's just and part of our bodies. So if we can dance then that, and it's safe to do so, then that's great as well. Um, the music and, and songs in particular can be used for reminis reminiscence and, um, and reminiscence can often lead to something called reverie where we're almost transcending our, our situation and, and it's a very pleasant place to be. So not all reminiscence is, is a, a nice memory. Sometimes it might be very unpleasant and it's, it's not uncommon for this to happen and come out in the sessions, but then you can cope with it and then move on. So, um, but that reverie where you're just going, oh, Oh, you know, big size. It's it's really lovely to witness. Um, the idea of personal playlists for people 
and, um, and, and people's preferences. So giving people choice that's going to align with their um, identity and their um, well-being rather than saying you're going to be listening to this. Um, there is also in a group situation the, the, the notion where it's not always your choice. So this might be Orchidia's choice and, um, and we're going to do Orchidia's choice at the moment. So it's all about that socialising and people generally um, like to be social in that way. Um, also, I put down there the Ronnie Gardiner method, and I and I nearly left it off the presentation. So it's a cheerful, um, structured, multi-sensory exercise program. So it is highly structured, um, where people are reading, they're talking. They're learning and they're counting, as well as um, relating it all to the music. So the music is what makes it fun, but it's very a cognitive exercise, which um, the people that I work with in this field are enjoying immensely. Yeah. But it's very new. Yeah, and, and it's new, but I think um, in our experience from um, using music therapy. And this is something that I really would like to stress. Um, when we talk about music for people living with dementia mm -hmm. or any type of dementia, for example, Alzheimer's, we're not just talking about young people, okay? We're talking about people living with severe dementia. It has progressed and they are probably um, in palliative care at the end of life, unable to verbalize things. If you use music as a recreation intervention, you are actually enhancing the quality of life of that person. Funny enough, we were having a conversation lately about it's about living until the end. It's not actually about just waiting to die or um, what this amazing woman, Kate Swaffer, will say, it's not about the GP prescribing me this engagement, but it's actually when we need it the most, we need to feel love and you can feel love through music. Um, oh, Lordy, this is a, a quite a, um, an intense looking slide <laughs> and I'm not going to read it, but I did um, a discussion basically about the difference between music therapy and entertainment. Both are fabulous, of course, um, and, and there are reasons why you would choose one or the other. Um, I'm just putting in there the reasons, particularly where you can change with the live music of a music therapist. You can change the key or the tempo or the format of the songs. Um, whereas if you're playing recorded music, it's all going at the one speed and if the, the people in the group can't keep up, frustration might appear. So, um, and if they only know the chorus, then just sing the chorus. Just sing the chorus again and again. Um, sing it loud, sing it soft, um, find ways to make it fun and invigorating. Yeah. Yes. And just for, for them to know, Jenny, just to remind them, the slides are going to be available through Gail. You will need to email Gail um, should you wish to keep a copy of the presentation, because there is quite a lot of information mm -hmm. in there, and we don't want to obviously bore you. <laughs> uh, but it's more about getting an idea on what are the benefits of this, or what are the benefits of this, and what am I going to be able to utilize in this moment um, or at this time. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about general considerations mm. because mm. Um, when we talk about uh, the ballerina, yes, we need to give people time to process enough to respond. And a lot of people around the globe have watched only the first two minutes of that video, but not too many people have actually watched 
the whole video in which the therapist approach her and encourage her. Mm. But he does it in a way that she will respond to. He's not a family member, but he's Spanish. He speaks her language. He understands that he needs to treat her like a proper Spanish ballerina. So he needs to touch her hand. He needs to kiss her hand, which is a sign of respect. And then she goes on again. It's uh, uh, initially she starts, she's listening to the music and she's moving her hands and oh, it's all just a bit too much. But with his prompting, he um, he was able to bring her back. And then and then I think she was even able to speak. She she was speaking and asking and answering questions. Um, and so that had kind of temporarily restored her. Um, age is important, um, but you can't when you're um, when you're picking songs for people and you're not sure or if they're not able to tell you a preference, then you can make some assumptions. But it doesn't mean that the old 90-year-old isn't absolutely into Pink Floyd or something that you might not have thought of. So um, music preferences are intergenerational. We like the music perhaps that we learned through our parents mm. and we also know and understand and like our children's music, et cetera, et cetera. I'm not sure how far that goes, but there have been lots of um, research on music preferences. Yes. So um, there's always the odd one, well, not the odd one, that's, that's the wrong word. It's there's always times where it's it's not appropriate just to assume that they're this age and this will be what yeah. they like. And also taking into consideration if we move uh, down on the list, uh, the people's emotional state on the day at that time, mm -hmm. um, cognitive abilities. Yeah, it is important to actually know what's the um, current abilities of that person, cognitively speaking, physically speaking. Let's say if you're going to be doing um, a playing group and you're going to be giving instruments to people out there, we need to take into consideration if actually someone will be able to hold that musical instrument. Spiritual needs, when we talk about a specific music journey, Absolutely. So when you're talking about somebody's spiritual needs, it's not necessarily religious. Um, it's just the things that make them um, get into that reverie state, I guess. Yeah, the it, social needs. It can be very tricky with, yeah. with in a group situation with one person's spiritual needs, especially if it's religious, both another person's, but um, you just need to negotiate that, yes. that ground. That's right. And then also, obviously, the social needs of the person, mm -hmm. the cultural needs are extremely important. And, you know, that actually makes me think, and we have a laugh about it, because obviously I wasn't born in New Zealand. Um, if I am to develop Alzheimer's living in New Zealand, and what you will have to care about me, it would be great if you can learn about, yeah, Spanish music. However, it was probably um, in English because I come from Mexico and we have a strong influence from the American music market. Mm -hmm. um, focusing on the strengths, setting realistic goals when we are doing a music therapy intervention instead of just assuming, yeah, we are going to be achieving this in six weeks. <laughs> exactly. There's ideas around whether it's a performance or whether it's therapy. Um, and, um, you know, you need to be aware of the differences, I guess. Focusing on their strengths, that is, if you focus on their strengths, then you will rekindle their sense of self-worth. Um, and... Um, and if you're, if they like to beat the drum, and if they've got some movement problems with their arm, you can just move the drum a little bit further out, extend them that way, rather than, you know, don't have them all up here because that's too hard for most people. So you've got to be a little bit 
careful with what you do. We, you can push them a little bit. Um, if you're encouraging them to move, then that's great. Um, if it's safe to do so, um, that's the idea of setting the realistic goals. Yes. Um, and most importantly, if you have questions, actually talk to a professional. Talk to someone who is qualified, who is registered, like a registered music therapist. But also, always keep in mind that it's about having fun because that's how we enjoy doing things. Because otherwise, um, if Jenny starts singing to me and she's looking all bored and upset, I am definitely not going to be connecting. <laughs> yeah. Um, just a little bit about exactly how we work together. And once again, this is going to be available for you. So I'm not going to go through that, but it's about what means to actually contact a professional person. And music has um, healing powers, or at least that's what we believe. Uh, it has the ability to take people out of themselves for a few hours. And a great example is when we had a really hard day at work and we had to drive home and we just put on our favorite music very loud and people driving next to you might be thinking, what is it that this woman is doing? <laughs> um, and now, Jenny. No. Oh, Ooh, okay. There we go. We're... Do you want to show them the, the last few slides? Yes, and that will be available for all of you. Yeah. We will come back to that. Um, okay, so do you want to just quickly let them know that there's some, some extra, extra resources, resources if they want to? Um, and that's more research. Now I've just put in there some yep. slides um, with some examples of strong, strongly rhythm music or the march music that people who um, are older at this time might know. So the um, it might be the melody that gets them going. It, it, you can watch their face, you can see their hands, something is happening. Um, and, you know, the nicest thing is when you play a song and they, their little feet go like this, mm -hmm. you know, they're starting to move. It's, it's, it's really lovely. So use the music, you know, make assumptions for them and then watch what happens. And if they're, if it's not right, stop that music. <laughs> Yes. Pick something else. So there's two slides for that. Yep. Another thing is the next slide. If you've got um, lovely residents who are verbal um, and, and, and have some, can do the compare and contrast, it makes for great conversations. So the same song with different people and you can discuss the music. And it's all, again, back to preference. So, yeah, thank you. All right, so now um, we would like to invite you. I know that we can't see you, but if you want to join at your own pace from home, we would like to finish our presentation with a little wayata. Um, which we believe most of you will know, but uh, if you don't, the uh, lyrics are on the screen. And yeah, so we, we'll sing this twice, and I, I'll, I can just sing the first line, and then you'll join in with me. And it saves us having to worry about starting together.
Jakarta. Jakarta, thank you so much for the time. We really, really appreciate it. And I believe now I'm going to stop sharing the slides. Um, and the floor is going to be open for questions. So I'm going to hand it over back to Gail. Hi there, back again. Huh? <clears throat> um, a couple of questions. Firstly, thank you for that wonderful session. Um, and the way you finished, it was just lovely uh, because it brings us right back into New Zealand, doesn't it? That's right. Um, one, of, one of my questions would be around, you said, in, you know, in terms of their age and culture, you would take a guess. Is there any particular time in our life when we would be more aware of the music that was going on at that time? I think there are, that's a good question. Yes. There are, I should, this is the key thing to music preferences. The lots of studies have been done that the most memorable music for people as their cognition declines has been the music that they experienced in their late teens mm. and twenties and possibly through through childbearing um, young families. It doesn't okay. mean that they can't remember the music from their 50s or, or et cetera, but as cognition declines, those are the most memorable areas yes. of time. So, um, and why is that? I think they think it's because it actually is a very exciting time, uh -huh. time of our lives and we are alive with, Putting putting those memories together because the the, the late teens and and the, you know, yeah the most early in time early adulthood yeah. and um, having families or yes. starting careers is they thinking that that is the time when your brain is most active at that um, memory planting yes. stage. Yes, I mean, the music from when you had your first love or your first breakout, right? That's Elton John. <laughs> she asked me, she asked me who was my favourite music. And I thought, oh, no. But I think Elton John would have to be. But, yeah. It's interesting. I've, I've worked in uh, residential facilities for quite a while, and I've seen lots of different ways that people use music to... Uh, enliven and get a response out of people. And I've always been surprised that there can be a group of people in their 80s or 90s and you put Elvis music on. Yes. Yeah. And so some, as you say, some music transcends age. It, it's the it's intergenerational. Yes. Yeah. So would that be the, the fact it was so popular or do you think it's just, it's got a very patchy beat? Or I think all of those things, and yeah. they loved. Um, depends what their um, uh, whether they thought that he was terribly risque or not. Yes. <laughs> if they thought that he was doing something that that was shocking, they probably would not remember it. Yes. Whereas if they admired him. For what he did, then they would be um, probably remembering. Yes. Fascinating our memories and our attachments to the music, but it's more than likely that if our child liked that song, then we attach a memory to that. So they play it all the time, and I'm enjoying listening to my child play that music or my parents. Yes. I've certainly seen, as I've been around, um, facilities using iPods now yes. with um, headphones yes. and also selected music. And I guess the family often gives that information. That's, that's probably the best place to go to um, and if the client themselves is not verbal. Um, the other thing is be, be wary, I would say, of just putting the headphones on and leaving that person because then they, it could be some kind of almost torture yes. 
that they are unable to, to prevent. So yeah. um, a music therapist would be would be watching to see yes. what happened. There would there would be a relationship there. I think you would love this music, yeah. and here it is. And now I'm going to put the headphones on you, and you can be happy over there. And I'm going to do this over here with Orchidia. But I don't think you would leave them unattended for very long. Yes. And my, my, my last question just relates to people right at the palliative end and, you know, all facilities have them where people just seem to be vegetative. What, what sort of music choice would you make there? Um, it depends if they're, um, it depends if they're agitated. Right, and you can see them. They're moving, and they might be in pain. They might. It might be just be a response that they have that they've taught themselves to do that movement, and they keep doing it. You don't know whether they're in pain or not. Yeah. Um. But so, if they're agitated, you can play some calming music. But if they're walking around, the, if they're in bed and agitated, calming music. But if they're walking around the, um, the facility mm -hmm. and anxious, then the worst thing probably would be to put some calming music on. So, so a music therapist, I think, would first of all match the mood that the um, resident is displaying right. and then slowly but surely slow the music down. So that's the key of playing yeah, live yeah. you can you can play like that because they're like and then slow it down and then and then the breathing comes yes that's so, right and i think what i can add i call that entrainment yes yes and i think all that i can add for example um i mean that's an awesome uh, example also for people that are still living in the community and with the families my recommendation, my professional recommendation, because we work with registered music therapists in care environments, is that if they have a recreational therapist who is actually qualified and registered, they will need to do a proper assessment and they will need to go to work together as part of the multidisciplinary team. So by the time the music therapists come on site, she becomes part of that multidisciplinary team and she will understand the person also physical abilities, cognitive abilities. So it's not just about getting the music therapies and there you go, we have hired you to do this, but it's actually about working together in partnership with the music therapies, with the family for now, with the team together in the care supportive environments. That's what is quite crucial. Not, not as a, an adjunct yeah. um, intervention to someone's life, you know. Like, so teamwork. Uh, That's right. Uh, so we could then say, oh, this person's got a, um, got a limp or um, a sore leg. So we need to actually practice some walking, improve their gait somehow. Um, if they're forgetting how to move, a good, strong beat is really helpful ordering the, the way yes. That they yes. and you've given us a, a great um, on your slides there's some great um, examples of all sorts of music so that'll be a great resource for people who get the uh, slides there's nothing like your own resource of <laughs> course you and youtube is a wonderful thing isn't it and i have found the most amazing um free app on my phone that slows music down so if they really if you're matching them with something um, so it's comes they still think yeah. they're doing Elvis yes. but um <laughs> Yeah, so it's, it becomes about what they can do That's right. rather than what they can't do, which yeah. is keep up with Alice anymore. Right. And can you tell us what that app is called? Um, yeah, you got your phone. Look yes. at my phone. <laughs> um, 
and I think just to kind of, I suppose, close up, unless you have more questions. Uh, no, that's all the, that's the questions I've got, um, okay, so that's, that's why we added the first um, slide in there on what did you got to see in there? Yes. So if I, as a family member or as a professional, have seen opportunities nowhere, then I, I am immediately building a barrier in my head. But if I get to see actually opportunities now here with music therapy, the opportunities are everywhere and the possibilities. Yes. So it's about how we grab that and yes. how we use them. Yes. Um, the app. I have no idea. It says okay. music speed. So the app is called Music Speed. But I don't. Um, you will be able to find it or oh, it's called Music Speed Changer. You can music find speed. it on a smart uh, phone like a Google yes. app yes. or yes. on Apple too. Okay. So it's blue and it it's sounds blue like a with a, with a um, let me bring it to you. Perhaps if you um if you put it on your references, that would be good. Yes, it looks like that. Does okay. It? Yes. Yes. Okay. Awesome. Well, that's all the questions that we've got today. And um, I just want to again personally thank you for your energy and enthusiasm for your topic. And I think it just helps people from all areas to see that there's other potential out there that is a non pharmacological treatment yeah. or different modality uh, that can help people with dementia. So um, with that, I think um, uh, I'm gonna say good evening to you all. Keep warm tonight. Um, you'll get a, um, a, um, a survey or a poll that will come out in the next few days where you can write anything else that you want to ask. And the other thing too, is that um, uh, those slides will be available if you contact me directly and I'll have a certificate for you in the next few days. So once again, that's all from um, the Dementia Learning Center and thank you particularly to these lovely ladies. Thank so you. Gracias. Gracias, yes. <laughs>